Hello and welcome to Off The Shelf Reviews. I'm Jeff. And I'm Gary. And today we're going to review and discuss Hardware, which came out in 1990, written and directed by Richard Stanley. Well Gary, what is the synopsis of this adventure? Well, the story follows Moses Baxter, played by Dylan McDermott, a space marine who returns to his girlfriend Jill, played by Stacy Travis, with the head of an android, which soon reactivates, rebuilds itself, and goes on a killing rampage. As in the 21st century, there will be a new endangered species. Man. It activates. It exhilarates. It exterminates. Get right on down to Reno's for your radiation-free reindeer steaks. Hurry while stocks last. This is a film that was almost sued upon its release, as 2000 AD claimed that Richard Stanley had completely stolen the idea from the story Shock, published in 2000 AD. And the, the, the finances of the film had to kind of settle it out of court and kind of kept it away from Richard Stanley, who did kind of admit that he was aware of the story, that he was aware of 2000 AD comics, but he said that the, really, the story really came to him in like a fever dream, kind of like James Cameron, where he had the dream of this robot skeleton being found in the desert and being resurrected. And of course, you know, he was also inspired by like stories from Philip K. Dick and, you know, all of the, the wider kind kind of sci-fi yeah. goings on at the time. And so it, it is kind of unfortunate that, you know, he was accused of, of ripping it off, but, you know. Yeah, it's always the smaller kind of independent operations get that get stung by bigger corpse often or not. Yeah. But um, it, it, again, it's post this kind of reinterpretation of a thousand stories. I mean, Absolutely. Every story gets retold an infinite number of different ways. This so, definitely has Richard Stanley's... Um, like visual and audio stamp on it they're yeah. making it very much a unique movie and this is a very low budget film shot in the uk uh for a budget of under one million pounds yeah a lot of famous faces pop up obviously a lot of front men to, uh, um musicians but um a lot of them are doing it for what a bottle of whiskey i think uh, well yeah <laughs> Le- lenny has a sorry lemmy has a as a cameo in the film and his payment was a bottle of uh, jack daniels you guys like music Check these guys out. Uh, they got Iggy Pop to do the uh, the radio kind of presenter, um, and that was because somebody at the studio had friends with Virgin Records and kind of got him to, to do a favor. Although, like the Lemmy part was originally meant to go to Sinead O'Connor, uh, but yeah, there, there are quite a few famous faces, and the film would have had, by by, by today's standards, very famous faces. If only the casting or the licensing or whatever was going on with the UK studios, they wanted Bill Paxton and Jeffrey Combs in the part. Um, but because they were only allowed like two American actors in this film, um, they, they... But they had to be fronted by for the uh, Americans because the production company, owned by the ever beloved Weinstein brothers, mm-hmm. um, were, or, you know, they, they made stipulations. It had to be a Amer- because they were trying to sell it to the American audience. They wanted American front leads for it. Yeah, well, the whole film was supposed to be kind of set in London, um, but then because they really wanted to sell it to America, the whole film ends up being set in New York. Stanley intentionally made ambiguous, I think. Yeah. Because, and that's why you end up with a multicultural cast. Right. He intentionally starts. Well, that's. Fit, and he makes it uh, ambiguous because I don't think he was. He wasn't. I think he was clearly annoyed that they made him remove it, move it from a different setting that he wanted to tell it in what he knew. So, but I think he made it more of a multicultural Blade Runner esque. It's the well, idea it, that it's it could a, it's be a any staple city. Of, yeah. of of dystopian, yeah. you know, sci fi futures. The where mixing of all the cultures, peoples of the, the earth, peoples. The yeah. cultures. That's why he had an Asian family living beneath her flat. Yeah, going yeah. gosh. So disrespectful, and like, <laughs> and she's not even married. It's like, ooh, <laughs> yeah. harsh lady, harsh. Yeah. Um, even though she's being, people are being murdered upstairs. Um, and well, again, you had like a couple of black security guards. You had the Asian family underneath. You had, and everyone was speaking with like American accents, uh, Irish, Irish accents, accents yeah. and British accents. It's an awesome like hodgepodge of all all different ethnicities and, and accents, is. which which is cool. But the film doesn't start in the city. You know, we have this like. Uh, Western kind of uh, music, synth music playing. Well, the soundtrack's really good as well, actually, for the whole oh, thing. Oh, it, it, it really is. It, yeah. it, it, it's one of the highlights. L- they have a lot of cool 
actually good rock songs co- crop up throughout the yes hell throughout. yeah because again i guess the musicians being involved in the movie were like yeah we'll we'll rot underwrite some of these songs for sure yeah, for sure yeah. but yeah sorry the desert sequence well the, the desert sequence you know it, it's bleak it's barren it's it's a desert um but we see uh, a carl mccoy who was the front singer for fields of nephilim who plays the nomad and of course richard sanley had directed music videos uh, for the fields of nephilim and so he's literally kind of playing himself from from those music videos in this and it is a really cool looking uh, you know outfit and attire that he has he's roaming the desert and he finds something gets his interest in the sand and we already see this this clawed like robotic hand sort of slightly moving and uh, he goes and he digs it up and he drags it back where we get introduced to Moses Baxter played by Dylan McDermott and Shades played by John Lynch who are hanging out with Mark Northover who plays Alvy which you might recognize him from Willow. (laughs) He also appears in some music videos I think they're all linked through various kind of Clearly through business things. He didn't, unfortunately, pass away when he was like 54, so he doesn't do an awful lot after this. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. He, he was a, he, he, again, all the actors in this were just clearly enjoying themselves. It oh, definitely. Feels like, yeah. Yeah. And then again, I, to mention all the actors in that scene there, they all deliver fairly well. I mean, obviously, the only one anyone's going to probably recognize really is Baxter. Yeah, um, Dylan McDermott. Dylan McDermott. He appears in a lot of more, he's a more of an American TV actor nowadays. Appears on a few crime procedurals, but obviously more interesting to us is American Horror Story, season one, two, seven, and eight, I think. Um, and obviously, I assume maybe more in the future because obviously American Horror Story is still going strong. Um, he's a good actor. He carries he carries his role fairly well, um, along with the other lead, I'd argue, which is his girlfriend uh, Stacy Travis playing Jill. Yeah. Um, but we get introduced to her quite soon. She's shortly after yeah. the scene. Well, we have the sequence where he ends up buying these robotic parts from this nomad. And they're kind of bartering as to how much they actually think it's worth. They don't actually know what it is. It's just these broken remains. Um, little do they realize that it's actually a prototype for a murder death machine. <laughs> and he ends up buying the parts and he's like, you know... We don't really get too much of his his backstory. We, we, we you know, I mean, I've listened to the commentary, and we I know that Moses Baxter is a space marine. He's fought on the front lines, um, and he has Shades, a cybernetic hand. He's got a cybernetic hand, so he's taken an injury. And again, somewhere. just to, just to point this film on a really low budget, but um, it looks all right. Everything kind of. Yeah. Ju- I think this is the point where I make against some other films we may or may not review before or after this because things come out of weird order with YouTube. Um, but this budget is very tight. And I'm certain that other films we reviewed recently had much larger budgets, but no vision. And this is important, that you can put together a load of average components and make a subpar or average film. But in this case, a lot of quite average, you might say, in terms of money spent, but the money spent was 100% on the net dollar. And again, they're getting a lot of free acting from famous people that probably helped this film quite a lot because it makes you go, oh, cool, Lemmy's in it. And it's just yeah. like, oh, I can watch a film <laughs> with, with Lemmy in it, um, even if it's only for a bit part. I'm not going to go off the deep end and call it like, uh, you know, a Picasso or a masterpiece, but it's definitely a very good indie film where before indie films were the trash shot on a camcorder in somebody's oh, backyard. Yeah. Richard Stanley did an incredible amount with very little. Just looking at the set design of like Alvy's kind of you know, warehouse of junk, you know, it, and like everything looks interesting, the way it's shot, the way it's lit and the way the film is scored. It's incredibly interesting. Like it's never dull. No, no, no. And I mean, like the pro- the props are all very beautifully handcrafted. I should also say that it was a very young Chris Cunningham who worked on the makeup and the special effects in the film. I think he was about 15 at the time. <laughs> <laughs> Again, slave labor. It's important to keep your costs down. Um... <laughs> Zone tripper. I've seen this type. The Hosey's full of them. <laughs> so he ends up buying uh, the robot from the Nomad. He ends up chatting with Alvi. And oh yeah, I was also going to say about Shades, his backstory. We don't actually find out about his backstory in the film. Richard Stanley said in the commentary that Shades is also like an astronaut and he works in space repairing satellites. Shades actually says that. Um, oh, he does. He talks about you should go work in space, man. And there's a conversation in the middle of the film where Shades is just talking to Mo and trying to convince him. Yeah, but he, he doesn't explain off. why he's always <clears throat> wearing the shades, and it's explained that it's because he spent so much time in space that he's got to readjust to the uh, to the sunlight, natural light, and it's going to affects his eyes. 
Um, but yeah, there's like there's you know there's so much thought that went into the characters that it doesn't always necessarily. Explain. It might have ended up on the cutting room floor again. Some of this film was also cut because they were trying to avoid the X rating at the time because yes. they didn't want to be associated with pornography. Right. Um, so it ends up with an R rating. It's got a good bit of gore in there. There was more potentially on the cutting room floor, potentially never shot for budgetary reasons. And probably to avoid an X rating. Yeah. Um, there's some nudity. There's some blood and gore. It's it's again. I wouldn't say it's graphic. Um, it's not like overly graphic in either case. Um, it's all fairly in- tastefully, intelligently used. Yeah. And it is. Uh, it's there when you it wants to be. I mean, it's dealing with you know. You know it's dealing and with it, it. at least it's one cool. of the characters that does get one of the goriest deaths in the film certainly has it coming to them. <laughs> but we'll get mm. to that now, as we do get back, you know, to 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 Jill's apartment soon, as they they're heading back there. And this is one of the like few moments we get to see outside of this apartment complex, you know, and we just see people trading, people, you know, in poverty. You know, it's it's like it it's incredibly world, yeah. low life. It gives you world building, which again I criticize oh, yes. other films for when they're like. It's the future. Well, well, what do you mean it's the future? Well, there's one shot of an outside of a kind of sci-fi cityscape and that's it. We're yeah. then going to go inside and it's going to be bland corridors with no real... Oh, no, you get that run-down industrialist exactly. kind it's of awesome. look. And you get the, the, the... You forget the taxi Yeah, I was ride. about to say, yeah, yeah. Lemmy, Lemmy explains to them, like, you know, before you could, you know, get through the town, but now everybody needs to have a firearm. Which he probably drops in the river, apparently. In the yes, end. it was a real firearm, <laughs> which he accidentally dropped into the river. They had to hire divers to go and retrieve it, and they never found it. So it was like, Lemmy, you cost us more by throwing that overboard than you did the payment, which was your bottle of Jack Daniels. Yeah, so, yeah, again, it's a cool little... um kind of taxi slapped on top of a boat yeah, yeah. through canals. But it's also, you know, he kind of breaks the, the fourth wall a little bit where he's like, hey, you should listen to these guys and he immediately puts on Motorhead. Just like... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Plugging your own music. It's a good yeah. move. It's a good move. Again, the world building is beautiful. The set design is quite not good. And again, you've got to keep in mind the budget and the period this was made in. It really is quite good in terms of what they've done. Again, yeah. vision is delivered and you really do feel the aesthetic of this hellscape and you're hearing the radio now and then and yeah. you're cutting to the tv now and then the tv obviously also has a rather again uncredited because well, i couldn't find him in any of the, the, the news broadcast the yeah new broadcast is a little bit captain of the red dwarf it's uh mac mcdonald exactly it's captain hollister or the guy from the aliens director's cut who's running uh the colony yes <laughs> and yeah. uh he's just explaining about yeah like the government's looking into population control and birth control because we're overpopulated in this horrible world. And everyone who's irradiated, because it's a post-apocalyptic world. It really is taking all the elements of post-apocalyptia and kind of from at least up to the 1990s and slamming them all together into a kind of wonderful mesh. And I mean, if you're a fan of the Fallout games or any of the post-apocalyptic movies like Mad Max, it's definitely inspired by those. But um, it's also, it's original enough. And that's the thing I, I always feel, you can borrow ideas from other people, but you have to make them your own. Yes. And I think this does. I think oh, this absolutely, is, 100%. Yeah. It's, again, post-apocalyptic, down-run city, run down city, you're kind of going to get some crossover with others, but it really does still set the mood, set the tone. You get comments, there's no rain anymore. It's like, I thought I heard rain on the window. You get a little bit later in the film. So it's definitely all leading you to this kind of, desolate hellscape earth the man's yeah. clearly ruined either <laughs> through nuclear war or some other things mad max could be wandering across the same desert the other side of the planet right. in australia well we kind of get like the that impression from jill when we get introduced to her when you know her apartment is locked up like you know like fort knox like it's really difficult to get into you know you've got these massive like shutter doors yes. you know all the extra Hydraulic security concealed. and she's like a hermit you know she doesn't venture outside at all you know, she doesn't want to, she doesn't need to. You know, and you kind of get that impression that these tower blocks are just filled with people that are just incubated and just staying indoors. So they don't want to or need to go outside because it's so harsh and horrible. Stanley out there. was right, coming, writing a lot of this from the kind of. Um, he'd just come off doing documentaries in Afghanistan at the time. Yes, and, uh, yeah. This was prior to. The, this is 1990, so it's the post Russia. It's the Russia-Afghanistan war kind of echoes yeah, yeah. of, and he was dealing, interacting with Muslim groups to kind of shoot their side of the story. Um, but obviously, all that tyranny and mayhem, the dictatorships and, and stuff, and that gets that that's you know influencing some of the television stuff that that Jill's that all watching. All flare up right now because again, yeah. you know, it kind of peters off as the film goes on a little bit because obviously then it gets into the action, yeah. and the 
the thriller and suspense side of the film. Uh, just a bit of trivia there is that uh, at one point she's flipping through the channels and it's Gwar, the metal band, that's playing, but it's actually the music of Ministry that's playing over that video, and you're like, what? Yeah, again. <laughs> if you know the two, you're just like, no, wait a minute, that's not right. It's a very strange film because it's, <laughs> all these rockers are clearly involved somehow, and yeah. uh, they've all given some permission to just mix and mash this all up. Yeah. Again, it could be the idea that the world forgets who exactly does what in like a hundred years, yeah. and things don't survive the test of time. Music might survive, the video might survive, but people haven't somehow mashed them together. <laughs> I like that kind of dystopian kind of broken future. We, yeah. We, we forget. We we don't know what happened ten thousand years ago. You know, there's been extinction events in human history. Where we find these huge, beautiful civilizations just swept clean. And yeah. It's like, well, there's some foundations. I don't quite know where they've all gone or how they died. But again, <laughs> it's the same's going to happen in a sci fi situation where you've got like the references to New York, where um, Shades is talking about going there to take all the fixtures and the nobody lives there. And I'm like, what happened in New York? Right. Which is like, oh dear. Um, and again, it's. Ground zero, maybe. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you kind of end up with these kind of terrible situations and the government doing terrible things to justify it like population controls that sound like optional sterilization do it for america right um although again it's not clear it's america it's kind of all kept kind of as yeah. i said vague in the kind of post nation age that it might well be for sure and you know that's kind of where most of the story for this film is is almost wrapped up and it, you know and the opening of this film like the first 20 minutes half an hour is just fantastic world building mm -hmm. you know and the story really you know is now just like now that mo has turned up uh, to, to Jill's apartment given her you know these robotic parts they kind of have like we, we can tell they have history you know she's not exactly thrilled to see him but she still loves him you know it's like she and Shane really seems to have an interest in they, her as well yes. but they never really explain or deal definitely, with her definitely yeah and again yeah. it feels like there's writing behind the writing which is fine and I kind of make a credit that to the uh, Shade's actor maybe again he's at least uh, showing that and again maybe the drug fueled kind of trip he goes on our right after this yeah. might be triggered by his kind of I don't know regret for not having the girl as it were yeah. I mean and it, it is all um, unspoken as it were definitely and again there was a lot, there's not a huge amount of details outside I mean you what you, you listen to a lot of the commentary tracks and stuff but um, it doesn't tell you everything and I think that's that's a good storytelling aspect and when, yeah. when it has layers to it that are clearly there but they don't need to they don't walk you through it all and again that that's kind of another bittersweet sadness to this because it's yeah. kind of the, all the characters are quite reasonably decent people. Yeah. Except yeah. the creepy perf who lives across the well, road. Well, we're just about to get to that now as uh, Jill has, you know, accepted her Christmas gift. This is a Christmas movie, by the way. <laughs> has accepted her Christmas gift uh, from, from Mo and is, you know, she's an artist and she's making a sculpture. We watch her melting down Barbie dolls and other things and making this fixture and respray painting the skull into the central fixture um and there's also a, a fairly extended sex scene between between her and mo and you know it's all done with almost like infrared um kind of like computer shots but we do keep cutting to the uh the pervert the the sick guy who's living across across the uh, the way who's got a telescope who's been watching her and occasionally calling her or or cold calling at her door, you know, definitely been harassing her. And, you know, we might recognize this actor. It's Porkins from Star Wars in his perhaps most vulgar and brutal role I think I've ever seen him in. in yeah, they film. don't hold back. He is, he well, is the deviance. He, um, he uh, came up with all of his own dialogue on set. And uh, I'm pretty sure they had fun while shooting it, but it's really out there. And, you know, he's narrating this entire sex scene and obviously getting off uh, on watching her. He's been watching her for a you know, prolonged period of time. And, uh, yeah, it, it, it is really gross. And it does take you, take you back just a little bit. And you go, oh, this is why it has a, it almost got an X rating. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's a shower sequence just before that as well, which is a little bit more... Like we said, it's the only nudity in the film. 
and it's fairly tasteful. Yes, it's all dealt yeah. with. Um, and the, it kind of, I think it's also to show you the grime of the world. Yeah, well, like how filthy just, he is. Yeah, they're both just filthy, t- dirty as hell. Uh, and again, it's the shower scene that references to the later echo that he's dreaming of rain. Yes. When he, she's actually woken up before him after the yeah. night, and she's cutting metal. And I think it's the uh, sparks flying that's kind of hitting surfaces that makes him dream that he's he- hearing he's rain, rain in the window. Yeah. Which again is the kind of there's a dark, sad romance to all of this, and it's yeah. kind of. It, it, it's because it's, it's, it's so bleak <laughs> it is bleak and I think that it, 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 uh, Stanley does well at kind of weaving that bleakness in um, in the way he does and it, it, it kind of also echoes when you have uh, Mo Moses reading the Bible again yeah. and it is kind of well that's because he gets a phone call uh, from Alvi again who's calling him back to his workshop saying like you don't understand this this thing that you left, found he left Alvi one of the hands to the robot without well, he left him almost well he left him yeah a whole bunch of the parts because I think he only really brought back the skull and certain parts no, of the he robot had, he kept the whole bag Okay, he kept okay, the whole bag. and he just left him. That's what he did, Alvi. yeah. Unfortunately for Alvi. Yes. Um, um, and Alvi's like, it's a Mark 13, it's a prototype, you need to come here, and I need to tell you this. Like, you're like, I, I can't talk to you over the phone anymore. And that's why he ends up going to the Bible and going to Mark 13, and he ends up, I think that's where he reads the no flesh shall be spared line, which isn't actually in the Bible. It was kind of like, it's it's ever so slightly similar. They're just kind of paraphrasing. Yeah, I mean, it's it's clever as in the sense that because he said it's the Mark 13, he looks in his Bible for verses of yeah. the Bible that align that, because he's clearly a man who has a religious kind of core. After his, his fighting on the front lines as a, as a space marine, yeah. <laughs> and so he ends up leaving leaving Jill and, and going to Alvi, and when we get there, we find that he's been you know brutally murdered. And Al, the workshop's in disarray. But it doesn't look like it's government and found out and killed him. There's no bullet wounds because he just flicks up his collar and there's a ins- puncture kind of wound. A puncture wound, and you see the hand, yeah, kind of scuttle off. Um, <laughs> and again, it is a moment of like, oh, that's, that's a horror trope. Um, but it's a fun one because again, the the robot is it, mentioned either I can't remember where it's mentioned now, but it's mentioned that it carries a toxin. Yes, I think it's when I was looking through all the notes for it, and he's yeah. doing some research on it. He's like, can't talk on a... Well, we see the computer display, which is where we get, really get to see what the robot looks like in, on, on that display. And well, well, it's got multiple point, arms. You know, it's got like a buzz saw. It's got the venom injector. Almost making a jab at America. You have uh, the um, Jill's resprayed the skull as the American flag. Yes. And yeah. I don't know like, she's good with an airbrush. Um, <laughs> and it's just like, and she, and she airbrushes it back into this American flag. And it's just like, oh... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the American... I've dark, dark military kind of aspect <laughs> being played out because, again, it is this robot that is essentially yeah. a nightmare creature of... From the government. The government, yeah. Which, yeah and, well, this uh, is what freaks uh, Mo out and he ends up calling Shades. He's like, Shades, you need to go and get uh, get into Jill's room. She's not safe. That robot we brought back is a homicidal killing machine uh, made by the government. But Shades is completely... O- o- off his face. Because seen Shades before, sitting before some candles, meditating, doing a little bit of Buddhist yoga, he, he's, tripping He's taken balls. something called like moon juice or moon dust or something, but you know, that for whatever reason, they couldn't call it LSD, uh, which is what he's actually on. So he is, you know, he's he's not there, you know, and he, he's like, oh, I'll go and get to Jill, and then he just passes out, falls over. <laughs> Yeah. So that means we know that like Mo has got to rush back to the apartment and we'll cut back to Jill who's in bed watching television and we see the robot like moving in behind her going in I well, mean you forget the assembly Yes, it oh, yeah, itself, oh, yeah. it detaches, it's powered itself up as yeah, well. It connects through the apartment electrics and just supercharges, and then all the parts come back together, rebuilds it from spare parts yeah. all around her apartment. Which is awesome. Awesome, yeah. like reverse photography as well. It's... Again, it's all within budget constraints, the re- construction of the monster. And again, well, speaking Richard's... of another film, as we said, um, Death Machine's monster was just so unimaginative. Um, and it just didn't look threatening. This does. And I think the way it's kind of pulled together in this kind of animation sequence, and I'm sure the budget of this is a lot less than that machine. Death yeah. Machine just doesn't deliver on its monster. The snapping jaws just look comical. Um, this, though, the kind of skull, I mean, it doesn't move, sure, 
and the drill spin and all the things. And you can tell yeah. they're a little bit um, fake if you look at them. But again, it's somehow the movement, the camera shots, the direction. It all pulls it together to deliver a monster that feels a threat to them. Yes, if um, you can see it. It's practically, it's actually there. You know, and uh, it's, Stanley wanted to do stop motion animation for it, but, you know, the budget wouldn't allow for it. Um, so what they cobbled together, you know, they use lots of different builds of this robot for all the different shots in order to achieve the There were look. some clever robotics involved. Yeah. Yes, there were, yeah. And, and so it, it tries to uh, to attack her on the bed and ends up just ripping up the bed sheets and you know, there's feathers and stuff flying everywhere. It fills the All screen. All the while the pervert's watching and getting a bit confused. Yes, yeah. And uh, and that's why he, you know, seeing this confusion, he makes his way over uh, to, to, to Jill's apartment. And, you know, we get that freaky look as he, she opens the door to him and he lets himself in. And he she's explaining, like, there's a killer robot in my room. And he's like, well, okay, yeah, I believe you. <laughs> and it's a prolonged scene you know where she's got the blowtorch and he takes it from her and they're wandering around the apartment and he's like there's nothing in here you know and he ends up trying to re-secure her uh her 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 apartment by using the computer and he has that really weird inspired or improvised song the wibbly wobbly walk oh we all walk the wibbly wobbly walk no i didn't and we all talk the wibbly wobbly talk. I know it's just strange. He's a bit <laughs> again. He he does steal the show. as the creep, and obviously, yeah. uh, but very shortly uh, his part in this will be ended. Well, yeah, um, he ends up wandering over to the window, looking outside, and like it made me think like, how did the robot? How did the Mark Thirteen get outside? Like, did it open the window? Well, it does Are it again later as well. Yeah. But again, it's 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 scurrying around a little bit. It's a super stealthy robot, considering its bulk and build. Yeah, it's it's playing an alien's card here, I think. Yeah, alien absolutely. Card, yeah, absolutely. The monster in the shadows. Um, and it is an incredibly gory death sequence yes, where it, one of the you know, two it gouges out of his eyes, you know, and it impales him. Like, and you know, because of the lighting, we can't really see it all. We can just see this blood spraying everywhere. Uh, and then his body is kind of smashed into the ground a couple of times. Yeah, he dies horribly. Screaming. And she's obviously <laughs> screamed and runs off and tries to hide in the fridge. Because yeah. um, she's smart enough. Again, there, there's an intelligence to the characters in this and the assumption they're not all morons, which I think yeah. is something, again, I have to credit this film with. And I think it, it the best films I can think of in terms of the horror genre that I personally enjoy are often when the heroes, heroines are actually responding intelligently yeah. to the horror, but still not necessarily winning. That's important to point out. Yeah. She's definitely, definitely kind of got that, that Sarah Connor vibe yeah. going on where she's kind she's of... She's a great actress. I think it's a shame yeah. she didn't get any more parts after this, but... Well, that's... we. Uh, I mean, it, this came out in Richard Stanley's commentary for the film where he said that she was a great actress. However, Harvey Weinstein pressured her into sleeping with him, and because she refused, he said he would destroy her career if she refused and of course she did and therefore we never we, really yep. see or hear from her again yep, it's, and th this came out in the commentary like a couple of years or even or maybe uh, maybe a few months before the whole controversy really kind of kicked off about Weinstein and and Stan, Richard Stanley's also gone on to say like the the crimes that Harvey has committed like the the whole me too kind of thing is like that's the only thing he's being pegged for when Stanley made it abundantly clear that there were many other crimes this man has committed that he's still not being charged with it's just like yeah. oh money and power and that's the thing that and people like stanley are dan endangering themselves by talking about it he, he was freaked out he said he could he hated harvey weinstein and you know he, he said you know, like richard stanley's a fascinating uh, director to just sit and listen to when he's telling his stories about how hollywood chewed him up and his interactions with these different people he's a fascinating character he really is yeah i mean and it's good that he's back in the business to yes. kind of making films with a more independent crew in the form of elijah wood's production company yeah which again we keep talking about here because we love all the films they're putting out yes but hopefully they keep putting out awesome films and people like stanley keep getting to play in that sandbox yes which is it's a it's the problem with gatekeepers like producers in hollywood in the form of um, Weinstein, um, Weinstein and his brother, his brother, again, I don't know, his brother seems to get, unfortunately, tarred with the same brush, but he's still a producer in Hollywood, and by that 
form you end up with these people who kind of hold people back from creating and um like we said the dictated stanley you have to set it with american leads uh go in an ambiguous yeah. american city which you're never quite sure what they are um and that, and that, that that's that's all because the producer said so. And you get some amazing stories of producers asking for some crazy bollocks. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, it may affect some of these films. The films we criticise sometimes it could have been screwed by the producers because sometimes the producers just are like, no, 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 it's got to it's got to be this or got to be that, and they'll dictate to the directors who have only got so much power. I mean, you see even more in modern films with like Ant Man, certain directors will leave the production because they're the studio wants what the studio wants Kevin and if Feige, you have a no, vision... credit, no discredit to him he's clearly made one of the most successful film empires in the form of all the marvel films ever i mean there's very few film series no there's no film series you can even compare to them that they've made that many films that have consistently made that much money sure the house of mouse is behind him but um he hasn't put a foot wrong and even though ant-man you could argue might have been better under Edgar Wright. Um, <laughs> um, and Edgar Wright is an amazing director. Absolutely, hands down, one of my favourite directors of all time. But, clearly, he couldn't work with Feige and the Marvel team. And that's not fair, but that's also a Hollywood problem. And it's hard to argue when they make all that goddamn money. So you end up in a catch-22 in that scenario, but I'd argue I would have preferred to see Edgar Wright's cut, my personal preference. But maybe it wouldn't have made as much money. Maybe it wouldn't have worked with the grander Marvel project, which needs all these films to interweave and be flexible in that constructive. You even get a problem with John Favreau, who didn't like how he was forced to crowbar so much into like Iron Man Two, and that's where he had a falling out with like the studio because you end up with these the need to weave everything so tightly together with all these other films and other creatives that it's hard to get that collaborative experience to work. And I think Feige now has all the writer rooms down the corridor from him, so he can try to keep the weaving as natural as possible. But the point being, a bad producer like Weinstein, who isn't just fucking with your film, he's also trying to fuck with your actors. It's a nightmare. Um, and and that, No, it's a true nightmare. And it's something, I mean, a little bit of a tangent here, but it's just one of the biggest problems with Hollywood. If you want to talk about great films, half of the great films not all of them, are going to be where the directors have fought tooth and nail to keep their vision. Yes. Against the forces of the studios. Or, not even the studios, the dark producers that sit behind them, kind of roaring, r- ruling over them like evil lords <laughs> from the shadows. And it, it's it's an issue. I mean, I it's just an issue. Yeah. It's just yeah. sad. It makes me sad. And again, I, li- I like all the actors in this. There's well, no real stinkers. <laughs> Let's get back to blowing the shit out of robots. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like we said, we're back to the main lead, and now we are pretty much following Jill, as we said, Stacey Travis's character, through most of the remainder of the film. Yeah, she's being chased through her apartment, but she does eventually, you know, like, uh, Moses manages to get back to the apartment, and Shades is just kind of slumped outside the door, like, completely given up. It's yeah, like... it, it, it's... Stanley's a pro drugs guy, but he doesn't make out Shades as a great innovative character of he- heroics at any point, really. Well... At the end, he sort of redeems himself, but it's like, I'm an attraction! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah no, I, know, I, I know, and again, Stanley's um, famous for having a very pro stance on all drugs. Yeah. Um, he's, he's an advocate. Again, listen to. Talking yes. about Stanley, listen to Stanley if you want to listen to some really interesting conversations. He's an interesting bloke. He's taken um, all kinds of psychedelics, and he's usually smoking a joint in every interview he's yeah, ever in. He's a he's a wild man, um, <laughs> and that's all cool. Uh, and so, well, yeah, Jill ends up blowing the shit out of the robot. You know, as as the doors open and everybody comes in just to see this robot, you know, being obliterated, and it's like, well, she managed to save herself. I know. And it's, we know this is a horror movie. And a whole, yeah, the whole, uh, sorry, a whole room's on fire and in what the security guards as well. <laughs> yeah, they were um, playing chess earlier and discussing how to beat uh, computers at chess. Sacrifice. By, by making a sacrifice, which yeah. computers don't understand. So yeah, okay, maybe that will play into the film later. Uh, and it is clever, and it's clever in the sense that he, Stanley is writing a little bit more nuance into the script. Again, like I said, it's not like, masterpiece level filmmaking here but it's clever i mean yeah. and that's something i'll credit this film with i can see it's definitely even at the time it was called predicted to be an indie darling in terms yeah. of 
being a cult film, and it is so good for that, because again, it is dealing with some really cool themes, delivers them pretty well, cool visuals, and this whole burning apartment, I just love the bit where she's kind of, and everyone's rushing in to kind of check on her. And... Well, she's got a big scar up the arms, you know, she was on fire on the, on the other side, you know, she's battered, she's beaten. And again, Stanley's good because he doesn't, I mean, like they said, there was a sex scene, but he doesn't over-sexualise her. Yeah. He isn't using her as a kind of... She's beautiful, just to point that out. She's yeah. a beautiful, red-headed, actress, young woman. And her face, she has really tense eyes and stuff. And the, the shots he uses of her are really intelligent. And again, it's not too... Um, it's not too exploitive of her. Um, and again, or anybody. It's The whole film, in a sense, is pretty... Nicely, nicely woven. I really like the film, and especially this sequence because it's setting up. The, you know, there's more to come, and the tension's quietly building as the robot sort of uh, starts to hijack controls of the uh, of the, the apartment. Yeah, and so it, it starts slamming the doors and <laughs> and, and kills one of the security guards in a fantastic <laughs> tears sequence. him in two. <laughs> Yeah, hydraulic. I mean, he, doors. Get, he gets stuck once, but then the doors open and they Bang. close again. Yeah, hydraulic pistons <laughs> cut him in half, and his gun goes off. Yeah, he ends up his killing car. his friend, his other other guard. Apparently, that was. Um... Well, that 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 guy was supposed to have a much more elaborate and gory death, yes. but again, like budget they, they couldn't afford to do it it would have taken all this extra work plus they were worried about the x rating and so yeah they they I, he ended up just taking a bullet to the head which is a shame but then again coming off the back of that guy being completely torn in two and then pulling his legs away and the blood spraying a everywhere. tragic comedic death is the nature of a good horror film at times yeah. you don't make it absolute slapstick but it's like Oh, the odds of him getting shot in the head when we needed some extra troops to fight the yeah. evil death machine. <laughs> Meanwhile, Shades is still, you know, completely intoxicated. He's bouncing around the yeah. apartment for the rest of this movie. Jill ends up going out the window because the robot, of course, is still alive. And she's dangling. She's dangling by a cable, an electrical cable. And so Moe's like, I can't, can't touch the cable. Like, we'll both be fried. Um, and he's and- like, drop, drop down to the apartment below. Drop down to the apartment below. And it's, uh, she ends up, you know, the, 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 the cable ends up snapping and she ends up swinging into the apartment below through the glass. And it honestly looks like she's died when she's landed And in he there. looks heartbroken at her Completely, death. Completely, yeah. And then and, he gets stabbed. Well, he then starts fighting with the Mark 13 and yeah, he ends up getting stabbed with that drug. Um, and, you know, you think he's holding it together. But then when you see all of the maggots and worms crawling up of his arm, he ends up taking the blade to his own own flesh and cutting himself we get all of the psychedelic visuals and like Richard Stanley said like you know this film is like taking a drug you take the drug at the beginning of the film and it's a slow burn and by the time you get to this point in the film the drug has taken complete effect yeah and it, and it's tragic because the main character who is the only sober character because right. she's seen smoking marijuana cigarettes obviously yeah. everyone else seems to be tripping balls uh, yeah um, except for Moses who is completely clean and and he's now, he now dies here in this psychedelic and that's nightmare. Like, Richard Stanley's always said like people work and do better when they're under the influence of some kind of drug, and so therefore the characters that are still going in this film it's amusing are the that ones that take drugs. It's contradictory in the form of again with uh, shades, but we'll, we'll ignore that because shades <laughs> is pretty useless to saving the day until well the very he, end. he does still save the day. You're like you it's know, a good distraction at the end. I mean Jill ends up fighting Jill's the robot. The her- she ends up though. using the saw blade again. It, you know, she's this is the criticism, though, because just to pause there, the narrative has kind of led you totally weaving. This is the only biggest issue with this film. The story is a bit meandering, and the finale is confusing. And again, your point of view character is open with Nomad, yeah. who isn't important, yeah. but he is sort of. He's almost the antagonist because he delivers the robot, and at the end you see him... It's not a big spoiler. You see him for no connected reason wandering off back into the desert to I guess get more problem robots and hand them out to people um, again it, it, it's a running gag but I mean there is the idea like that uh, Jill says that she's being harassed by someone and if it's not the sex pest pervert guy it could be the nomad who for some reason wanted to get to Jill <laughs> just like <laughs> yeah I mean, there's it, lots of different ideas and theories and again yeah you're right that that was something that kind of occurred to me because it was like the sex pest never left his apartment by right the of it. so it, it it was odd that that ties in um and again it's the um 
whole film as a whole is dealing with really interesting issues along that line. But the narrative so confusing with who's the point of view character because Jill sort of pops up, then you go back, you keep following Mo for like about the first half of the film is yeah. Mo's film. And then he passes away at this point in the second third. Yeah. Um, and then it goes back to being Jill's film. And because she's not dead, she actually wakes up. <laughs> yeah, Jill wakes up, but Moses is passing away upstairs, the man yeah. she loves. And then she kind of rampages upstairs to see to, you know, to go and take out the the Mark Thirteen robot in an her, epic finale. Yeah, yeah, and and it's it's pretty good. I mean, again, <laughs> a budgetary restrictions. Well, she finds out that the robot, you know, its only weakness is she um, does communicate with it, which is yes. Um, it, it's again a classic trope where you're like, "What do you want? What do you want?" It's just like any. But I think Stanley said it was um, the robot's not to be blamed. It's just following its programming. Oh yeah, yeah. kill everybody. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Which is like, brilliant. Thanks, thanks, uh, evil government. Why'd you just have to be so evil? It's just like, that, you know, making it... Ra- I mean, it is comically evil robot time. But um, it isn't... It, somehow it doesn't become fast in that form. Like yeah. other films we reviewed. Where you end up with a monster that's like, why is it doing this? Nash, 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 nash. <sighs> yeah. We're not sure. He hasn't made it very clear what he programmed it to do. Kill everyone? Yeah, but it's sterilization. Not... Yeah, again, this is a sterilization robot. Again, and you're getting that theme with like everybody volunteering to sterilize. And you know, you're probably too irradiated. We'll probably have irradiated babies. You don't want irradiated babies. It's like, what? Are you looking for cancer cells? And again, it's dealing with all these kind of dark future issues. And they've decided to make a kill robot that kills everybody. Yeah. Absolutely everybody. Because that can't go wrong. I mean, yeah. <laughs> well, I she lo- ends up luring it into the shower. You know, she knows that's its only weakness, but she gets kind of gets pinned in, and that is where Shades does come in to save the day. Firing off a gun, distracting it. She fires it. off the gun, distracting it, which lets her turn the valve, which hits the hits the water, uh, which then uh, breaks down and, and kills the robot. And then we get the slow mo as she continues well, to swing again, the baseball bat. It's playing the rain theme as well because yes. Moses. The water is life, but of course, it's the only thing that's going to bring death uh, to this killbot. Mm, yeah, again, it, again, there is some, there is some theological kind of philosophical underpinning here, where water's life for them, but water's death for it. Yeah, and it, it's kind of a, it's kind of interesting. If it, again, if they design it intentionally to avoid, to be destroyable by water, I suppose the government have a good plan. Except the world's a pretty much a desert now. Um, I don't know. It, it it is it is a strange ending. At that point, you kind of have her smashing it to pieces, as you say, yeah. in the baseball bat. But and... we cut to uh, to uh, Angry Bob's Iggy Pop uh, going over the radio, explaining that the government is now unleashing its army of Mark Thirteen robots into service. Sign up now to help construct them. Four hundred jobs available. And again, it's <laughs> and then it cuts back to Nomad walking off into the yeah. desert. Well, the, the, you know, Richard Stanley does have a script for for a second one called Ground Zero. Uh, but it never got off the ground. Despite this film being a um, a commercial success, it made you know almost five times its budget back. Um, yeah, the, the legal issues I think tied it, it up. It's though. the fact that like multiple different companies own the film, and so you know you couldn't get all of them to sign off on making a second one because they're all like, no, we own the rights. No, we own the rights. No, it's ours. And Again, so as we said, I believe all the rights have reverted back now. But it's been like thirty one years. Yeah, I d- I don't know how. Um... I'm sure that the actress uh, Stacy Travis would like to get back in the film, but uh, yeah. I, d- I don't know if uh, st- he intends to write a thirty-year-on story. It's Hell, a shame. She could have it's been pregnant with the main character's child, and you could go off in a storyline with all that thirty years later with their kid. <laughs> well, there was also talks of a TV series at one point, but yeah, I, I don't know if it'll. Ever... I think it's too far down the line, and I think there's a lot of sci-fi that's done what it might do. Yeah, um, unless Stanley's ideas stands up as original. To this point in time, time. for sure, um, yeah. it, it, I, I'd be reluctant. I, again, it's again, I don't know what he's got, and I mean, Stanley's created some awesome stuff lately, so maybe it's in the pipeline with old uh, Elijah maybe. Woods' production company. <laughs> but um, he's doing obviously they're doing a lot of uh, Mythos Cthulhu stuff first, so we'll see. Keep your eyes peeled. Um, Indeed. Well, Jess, uh, what are your favourite scenes? I like a lot of this film. Again, the visuals are strong. I mean, he puts a lot of filters on lenses, which you could grumble about a little bit, but um, I don't mind that too much. Again, it's trying to give you the idea of sometimes it's the desert where you have the opening scene in the desert where there's a filter on it. I think it's quite orangey yes. glow to the whole um, scene, which makes you feel, again, the radiation and he's cutting through the barbed wire at the opening. And it kind of gives you that feeling. And, the, and then you finally see the head up close and it's quite a nice prop. Um, the course, two de- two major deaths, which is obviously our pervert and our security chief, 
both pretty spectacular and not bad. Again, they, the camera shots are intelligently done. Um, they don't hold back on the goal entirely, but it is kind of a little bit off shot. Uh, yeah. Again, like we said, I think they were playing the walk in the rating line on this film. Again, ratings have become more liberal as time's gone forward, but uh, 1990, I guess they were really trying to keep it as safe as they could to avoid the X rating. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of in agreement. Like, I, I, all, all of the scenes in this film are favourite scenes. I know. Just because really of difficult. the visual audio presentation. It's, it's got a lot it's of integrity. It's so good. Yeah, every shot's considered, and this is where Stanley gets credit, I think it is for a first time big production. Yes. Because he'd done some film work before in music videos yeah. and documentaries. Yes, yeah. Um, he really does pull together on a shoestring budget in terms of big Hollywood films. Um, a quite nice visual. I mean, like you have uh, the taxi at the opening. Yeah. Even though you, he keeps the shots tight to avoid too much of the surrounding area, and obviously you have this canal shot almost of uh, the taxi going up the canal, and the, I mean, you're not you're kind of like, well, he hasn't populated everything in the background a hundred percent, but it's not wide enough shot to tell you that it's clearly struggling on the budget restrictions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it, but it still gives you the world building, the world feeling that it's kind of a dark cyber tech yeah, kind of that's what I love all, all the world building you know the matte paintings in the background the, the, the TV uh, edits you know the, yes. the, the, the custom made uh, cannabis cigarettes and it's and it's cybernetic hand the cybernetic hand the sets it's it, uh, it, it there's the shower so much scene, to take in the shower scene is um, for me was distracting in terms of like oh this is a pretty woman oh cybernetic hand and they kept it and like the way it, yeah the, the, like they, the pipes and the valves and the going way into the skin arm is, it, is yeah, yeah. The, the prosthetics there looked good yeah I mean they, they held up I mean it's like the Gandalf nose point where you're like oh maybe I can see where the silicon <laughs> kind of uh, now on 4k with Gandalf on big screen I can see the big fake nose on <laughs> well Jess do you recommend <laughs> hardware yeah yeah I'd say it's a pretty fun film um, definitely a cult sort of undertone to it I think I'm sure everybody who is into this sort of genre hardcore knows about it like and um i failed i didn't actually i hadn't seen this before i don't think i've seen it in its complete entirety anyway um and it is well worth a watch i soundly recommend it good acting um everything's good and uh, compared to other films where everything's average this is everything's good and it's put together competently edited competently with a great soundtrack the biggest criticism i'll i'll gripe at is it's a little bit meandering in its narrative structure um, point. I mean, maybe that again. Maybe that's by design or some unintentional accident, flaw in writing. But it meanders itself through this story. You never quite sure point of view character. Um, the hero heroines change. I mean, killing a character halfway is a subversion, um, and it is setting up Mo Moses, Moses um, to be the hero, and then kills him, being heroic. But um, it then switches back to our female lead, who is essentially the main hero of the piece but there's no real the real enemy is just an external threat and yeah i like it overall without going any more off on a tangent there <laughs> um philosophically speaking it's uh, it does deal with some issues but it's otherwise a fun entertaining robot that is in disguise that he's slaying and uh the slaying gets done well i'm <laughs> proud of you <laughs> this gets a must watch from me Especially if you're looking for an ambitious, low-budget, dystopian, sci-fi action horror movie from a director with an artistic eye and passion for his project. This is a commonly overlooked hidden gem that was hugely successful on release, but sadly fell into obscurity despite remaining a cult classic. And it remains one of my favourite films. I love this film for its visual presentation, outstanding music by Simon, Simon Boswell, with the awesome th synthesizer score and mix of blues with electronic and industrial sounds. I admit many scenes can feel like padding, and there isn't much story once the mayhem begins, but the actors do a terrific job at bringing these characters to life, and Stacey Travis was able to hold the film together with great screen presence. The film has some great map paintings, creative design choices with the Mark 13 robot, use of reverse motion photography, interesting atmospheric lighting, awesome set design, believable costumes, and all of it does come together beautifully. It's slick, 
stylish and multi-layered and really holds up well today even after multiple repeat viewings this is what you want this is what you get <laughs> go and see cow hardware it's a must watch have a good one. <laughs> thanks for watching off the shelf reviews Wibberly wobbly walk, and we all talk the wibberly wobbly talk. Oh, we all wear wibberly wobbly ties, and we look at all the pretty girls with wibberly wobbly eyes.